Welcome to the third class or interactive uh, lecture for chemical kinetics. So um, last time we ended by um, introducing the concept of a catalyst. Uh, here are some examples of catalysts. Uh, we'll use one that is uh, has to do with automobiles and one that's uh, biochemical has to deal with living organisms. Um, so automobiles have things called catalytic converters um, which are what they sound like. They use a catalyst to do some converting and when an automobile engine runs, a standard gasoline engine, uh, it produces some waste products from the combustion of the gasoline. Those go through the exhaust pipe and they run through or past some catalytic converters before the waste products are dumped out the tailpipe. And uh, here's sort of a cutaway version of a catalytic conversion, a uh, catalytic converter. Um, and one of the reactions that takes place is we have some incomplete combustion, so we have some carbon monoxide produced rather than carbon dioxide. Uh, we have some very incomplete combustion where some of the hydrocarbons don't really get fully burned at all. They're like broken into little chunks, and so you've got some uh, hydro smaller chunk hydrocarbon molecules. Uh, and these are pollutants, but we can get them to react with oxygen and to undergo further oxidation for their combustion and turn into carbon dioxide and water which are more benign waste products. Now carbon dioxide of course is a greenhouse gas um, and so it's not like there's no issue with doing this but there's less danger to uh, immediate danger to health than from unburned hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide. Um, and then another thing that happens is in the high temperatures in car engines nitrogen and oxygen in the air uh, actually turns into nitrogen oxides NO and NO2 and those are air pollutants as well and they produce, pr provide or produce some health problems and so those we'd like to turn into more benign substances so again a catalytic converter is used to uh, turn the nitrogen oxides into back into the original elements, nitrogen and oxygen, um, which are, um, well, the basic components of air. So, how does this work? Well, here's kind of our little cartoon version of a catalytic converter. And it turns out that catalytic converters uh, typically have two catalysts. They have a reduction catalyst and they have an oxidation catalyst. Uh, both of them tend to be sort of honeycomb structures with lots of open spaces. Uh, basically you're trying to get a very high amount of surface area for uh, exhaust molecules, uh, gas exhaust molecules to have as surfaces that they can uh, hit and interact with. That's kind of how the catalyst works. Uh, and then the surface of this is coated with um, some sort of a metal that does a really good job of being a catalyst and they tend to be relatively rare and expensive metals like platinum and rhodium and palladium etc. And that's why catalytic converters are typically very expensive because the metal in, that's used in them even though it's used in very small amounts is quite expensive. Um, on a reduction, in a reduction catalyst, what ends up happening is you have things like the nitrogen oxides that we talked about uh, just a second ago. Um, they hit the surface and the catalyst actually kind of holds them briefly on the surface, lets them slide and move and interact with each other. And when they slide and move and interact with each other, you have some bond breaking between the nitrogen and oxygen um, atoms in the nitrogen oxides and then there's rearranging to make nitrogen N2 and oxygen O2. So here we have a reaction of the nitrogen oxides being converted into nitrogen and oxygen and that produces much more benign gases to go out the exhaust pipe. And the oxidation catalyst 
takes these unburned hydrocarbons, so here's a really unburned hydrocarbon, uh, essentially a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbon long chain, so that's a heptane molecule, and then some carbon monoxide, which wasn't fully oxidized to carbon dioxide, and again, those will hit a catalyst a surface where they'll be kind of held in place and they'll be able to slide to interact with other substances, and then they produce carbon dioxide ideally and water so you kind of get a complete combustion facilitated at this oxidation catalyst and then again we're producing more benign compounds to be dumped out of the exhaust pipe. Okay now how does a catalyst do this? How does it, uh, well what does it do and how does it do it? And it speeds up a reaction and it was mentioned before that it speeds up a reaction by lowering the activation energy barrier. So if we have, here's a reactant, and then it has to get over this activation energy barrier to make the product without a catalyst. If there's a catalyst, that barrier is lowered. Um, now it's lowered by having some different pathway for the reactant to get to products without having to go over the original hill. So it's almost as if you'd like somehow, you know, put a tunnel through the mountain at a lower elevation and you've got a, you know, a little lower, or you don't have to drive up as high uh, to be able to get over that mountain pass or mountain peak. Um, and usually the catalyst um, is what facilitates this alternative pathway and just as a note um, a biological catalyst is called an enzyme so catalyst is a generic general term and if it's a biological catalyst it's specifically called an enzyme so with the catalyst the activation energy barrier is lowered and here's an example of how this works using now a biological example. So we have an enzyme, for example, sucrase, the enzyme, which is a big complicated biological molecule. We're not showing the details here at all, um, other than the general shape. And enzymes tend to have an active site that is just kind of the right shape and size and has some um, polar regions in just the right space so that the substrate, in this case it's a molecule sucrose, so sucrose uses the enzyme sucrase and the suc sucrose fits nicely into this um, active site in the enzyme. It binds to the enzyme with what's called an induced fit, so it fits in there just nicely um, and, and snugly and then the enzyme is able to facilitate, in this case, the breaking of the bond to convert the sucrose, the disaccharide, into its two monosaccharides, glucose and fructose. Um, water's needed to do this, uh, and so in general, in, in this specific case, and so in general, the substrate, sucrose in this case, is converted into the products, glucose and fructose in this case, because the enzyme's active site holds the molecule in place and sort of bends and flexes it a little to help the reaction take place and then the uh, products are released. And notice now the enzyme is back to its original state with an empty active site so another sucrose molecule can jump in there, undergo the reaction, dump out the products glucose and fructose and then do it again, do it again, do it again and it can do this you know millions, tens of millions of times per second and that's really important because we have all kinds of biological processes going on in our bodies and we you know cells are small they have a need to have a lot of molecules in there to do various things and so if a molecule is reusable millions of times per second um, that's a really efficient way for things to go and it uh, it's kind of critical for life itself. Now at this point I just want to note there's a really nice video on how enzymes work from the Research Collaboratory for Structural Bioinformatics uh, actually from their research database and the link to that is uh, just below the link to this class um, it's uh, about 
five minutes, a little less, I think, and it, it uh, has a really nice animation and description of what's going on for you uh, bio folks in particular. Um, shows some things that really hard to show with uh, you know, PowerPoint images or, scra or uh, kind of scratchy uh, pictures on a, on a whiteboard or that sort of thing. So I highly recommend you spend five minutes of your life uh, at some point just taking a look at that uh, video link. Now we've spent a, most of the unit dealing with something that provides us with quantitative information about the kinetics of a chemical reaction. So what would be the choice here to fill in the blank? What is it that provides us with quantitative information in general about the kinetics of a chemical reaction? So answer that, please. And hopefully what you said is it's the rate law. Uh, that's what we spent most of our time doing is determining rate laws and then using rate laws to uh, determine quantitatively uh, things about the reaction. How long does it take for you know, a certain amount of substance to be used up? How uh, much substance is left after so much time has uh, gone by, etc. All that information comes from the rate law or things related to the rate law. Now the last thing we're going to do here is to look at something uh, in general that describes what actually occurs at a molecular level. So what would that be? What do we call this? Uh, what describes what actually goes on at a molecular level? This was discussed in a screencast. So see what you come up with. And hopefully you say it's the reaction mechanism that describes what actually occurs at a molecular level. So we're going to go over this a bit. Uh, building, we'll, we'll also review some stuff that was in the screencast on mechanisms, but we'll build on it significantly and go through some examples. And uh, a couple things to note. The stoichiometry of an overall reaction, this is a reminder, can't be used in general to determine the rate law. You can only determine rate laws by performing the appropriate. Well, please fill in the blank with what's the right answer here. And hopefully you said, in general, you have to do an experiment. Um, that's how we, we do experiments. That gives us that gives us data that lets us determine rate laws. Now, important note, if we are dealing with what's called an elementary reaction, which is just one single step in the reaction, then stoichiometry can be used to determine the rate law. And I'm not going to go into the details of why this is. It's, it's not too incredibly tough to explain, but um, I'm going to just hope on this you'll trust me that it's true. Um, if we have an elementary step where this is just like one step in the reaction, where A, substance A, makes products and the coefficient in front of A is 1, then the rate law is rate equals K times A to the first power. So the coefficient becomes the exponent for A if and only if this is an elementary step, not an overall reaction equation. So very important to note, we can do this for an elementary step. If it's an overall reaction equation, then we can't do this. We have to do experiments. Um, now, if there's only one molecule that makes products, we call this unimolecular, one molecule. Now, that's the basic idea. You probably can um, guess what's going to then be true for these other examples. And again, this is a bit of a recap, a uh, reminder, review. If we have A plus B makes products and that's an elementary step, then we can predict the rate law. See if you can predict what it would be for this one. Because remember, if it's a step, then we can get the rate law directly from coefficients. And hopefully you said, well, there's one A, there's one B, therefore the rate law is rate equals K times A to the first times B to the first, because the coefficients for A and B become the exponents. Again, if and only if, it's an elementary step. And you can probably say, we have one molecule of A with one molecule of B, that's two molecules. We call that bimolecular. Um, one more to try. What if A plus A make products and that's an elementary step? What's the rate law for that? And what's the molecularity? And hopefully you said, well, A plus A, that's really two A's, so that's rate equals K times A to the second power. And since there's two A's, that's two molecules, so that's bimolecular as well. 
And then a plus b plus c, the rate law will be rate equals k times a to the first times b to the first times c to the first. Um, do note this is pretty rare uh, for this to happen. You have to have an a molecule hitting a b molecule and a c molecule all pretty much at the same time for this to be a uh, elementary step. Um, and so this kind of thing, which you probably would say should be called trimolecular, but for some bizarre reason, we call it termolecular instead. Uh, termolecular uh, uh, elementary steps are not that common, uh, but they do exist, and that's a, another thing to be aware of. Okay, now what do we do with this? Well, the elementary reactions and or the elementary steps, we use both terms interchangeably, uh, and the order in which they take place and some of the details about how they take place comprise what's called the reaction mechanism. We propose reaction mechanisms to explain how the reaction occurs at a molecular level. It has to agree with the rate law. If it doesn't agree with the rate law, it cannot be true. Um, and if it works, in other words, if we propose a mechanism, it matches the rate law, then we call it a plausible, but it's not necessarily definitively true that it's the mechanism. Um, and we then would have to do further experimental work to provide support for the proposed mechanism or to disprove it. And again, we won't go into all of the gory details of this. You can do an entire course in kinetics. You can spend a lifetime spending, studying kinetics and reaction mechanisms. Uh, we're going to just do some of the basics. But, you know, it's kind of like this. What if Colonel Mustard was found dead in the billiard room and there was a revolver with Professor Plum's fingerprints on it? Oh, and Colonel Mustard had been shot. You might say it's quite plausible that Colonel Mustard was shot in the billiard room using the revolver uh, and Professor Plum did it. Now, of course, you could probably figure out some scenario where despite that evidence, that's not really what happened. And if nobody saw it, uh, or you don't have video evidence of it, you might be right. It seems quite plausible that's correct, but you might be wrong. There might be further evidence coming down the road. Um, and so it's um, reaction mechanisms are a little bit like solving crimes where you have evidence that indicates something, um, but you're going to maybe need more evidence to be conclusive uh, or certain about that scenario. Okay, well, enough um, background review. Let's crank through a reaction mechanism example and see how this works in practice. And again, um, these can get really complicated. So if you think the example we do is complicated, they can get much worse than this. Uh, we won't do anything harder than this particular example. Um, but let's kind of look through the details. So we have a reaction. 2H2 plus 2NO makes 2H2O plus N2 when they're all gases. And we find the rate law, by experiment of course, to be rate equals K times H2 concentration to the first power times NO concentration to the second power. Now notice the H2 coefficient is 2, the H2 order is 1. The NO coefficient is 2, the NO coefficient or, or order is 2, so we couldn't have predicted the rate law exactly just from the reaction equation. Um, and the following mechanism has been proposed. Step one is that two NOs combine together to make N2O2, and there's a double arrow here indicating this is equilibrium, and we're going to propose that this happens really quickly. So really quickly, two NOs smash together, and they make an N2O2, and then they're in equilibrium with each other. And then step two is that the H2 combines with the N2O2 that was produced in step one to make H2O and N2O. And then in, oh, and this is a slow step. And then N2O that's produced in step three reacts with another H2 to make N2 and H2O, and that's a fast step. Um, now, one thing you might be asking is, where did this come from? 
Well, this mechanism was proposed as a possible explanation for how we get this rate law and what's going on in this reaction. Uh, in generally, proposing mechanisms is pretty challenging. Uh, we are not going to do that in this course, so you won't be expected to propose a mechanism. But if I or someone else does propose a mechanism, you're going to need to be able to analyze it and say, is this a plausible mechanism for this reaction? And the way you'll tell that is you'll find out the rate law for this mechanism and see if it matches the experimental rate law or not. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, there's a couple things. One is the mechanism absolutely has to add up to the overall reaction equation. So if we add up step one plus step two plus step three and cancel out things um, that are the same on the right side of one equation and the left side of another equation, these three equations for these three steps ha has to add up to the overall reaction equation. So check it out, give this a try, add these three uh, steps up. Does this set of three steps add up to the overall reaction equation? Yes or no? And hopefully you said N2O2 produced in reaction one is used up in reaction two or step two. N2O produced or used, uh, produced in step two is used up in step three, so those cancel. And then NO, there's two of them on the left. And then there's two H2s, one from step two and one from step three. So all of that's on the left. And then on the right we have an H2O and another H2O and then an N2, so that's two H2Os and, and an N2. And yep, that adds up correctly. So this does give the correct reaction equation. So the mechanism passes the first test. It at least adds up to the right reaction equation. Now we're not done. A lot more to do. What are the reactants? What are the products? So see if you can answer that before we uh, go on. What are the reactants? What are the products? And hopefully you say, well, the reactants are what we start with, H2 and NO. The products are what we end up with, H2O and N2. Notice that the reactants and products are for the overall reaction. There's a bunch of other things, N2O2, N2O, etc., that are in the steps, but those are not reactants, they're not products, they're produced in one step, used up in another, so they're not reactants, they're not products, they are a different thing. So based on that um, preview, what do you think are the intermediates in this reaction? And what's the catalyst if there is one? And hopefully you said N2O2 is produced in step one, then used up in step two, it doesn't show up in the overall reaction equation. That's what it means to be an intermediate. It's an intermediate thing between the reactants and products. It doesn't show up in the overall chemical equation. It's used up, it's produced in one step, used up in another. And then hopefully you said N2O also is, uh, use, is produced in step two, used up in step three, so that's also an intermediate. And then remember what a catalyst has to be. A catalyst has to be something that's used in one step and then regenerated in another step because it isn't used up. So if we have any substance that's used in one step and then regenerated later on, that would be a catalyst. Do you see anything like that in these three steps? And hopefully you said, nope, in this case we don't have a catalyst because we don't have anything that was, let's say, used in step one and then produced in step two. Okay, what does this reaction profile look like? Now we've done this for overall reactions, but we haven't done this for the steps. And for steps, each step is like its own little separate process or reaction which is with its own little activation energy. Um, so you're going to actually have multiple humps or activation energy bumps in our graph. And then uh, to get the energy profile, you're going to have to know what the overall delta H for the reaction is. So I'm just going to tell you the delta H for this reaction is negative 666.2 kilojoules. And we have three steps. 
of which the first and third are fast and the second is slow. So see if you can figure out, give it a try, what the reaction profile, the energy profile for this would look like. Where are the reactants energy compared to the product's energy? And then when you have some humps in the middle, which one's gonna, which one's gonna be taller, which one's gonna be uh, not as tall, and why. All right, and hopefully you did something kinda roughly like this. And the key aspects are reactants energy is higher than product energy because delta H is a negative number, negative 666 uh, kilojoules. So this is an exothermic reaction, so the product's energy has to be lower. There's three steps, so there's gonna be one, two, three activation energies. The slow step is gonna be the one that has the highest activation energy, so that's the step two. And it's hard to know the you know exact details of where these valleys are, but there have to be three bumps, and the second bump uh, or hill has to be the tallest of the three. Um, which step is rate limiting, and what's the reason for that? And hopefully you would say, well, the slow step, which is step two in this case, is the one that limits the rate of reaction. If step one is fast and step three is fast, then everything in terms of how fast the reaction is going to go depends upon the slow step. So the slow step is always the limiting uh, step for the rate of the reaction. And there's a bunch of different analogies used for this, but you know, imagine we were pouring water from a beaker into a flask and we poured it through three funnels, a small funnel, a medium funnel, and a larger funnel. If you pour it through, uh, if, if the first funnel you're pouring it through is the small funnel, then that's going to have a slower flow rate. As soon as it throw, flows through funnel one, funnel two is bigger, so it's going to flow right through that, and funnel three is bigger yet, so it's going to flow through that. So the rate at which this pours through the three funnels is going to be totally dependent upon step one, funnel one, because that's the narrowest stem funnel, and that's going to slow the rate of the pouring. Now, of course, if we did it in a different order, if we have funnel, uh, the small funnel in the middle, the liquid will pour quickly through funnel, uh, th through the, the bigger funnel, it'll be slowed down by the middle funnel, step two in this case, and then it'll pour quickly through the bigger funnel, so now everything's dependent upon the step two funnel. And then, of course, we could also have step three or funnel three being the small one so it pours quickly through funnel one pours quickly through funnel two and it's slowed down so everything depends upon the bottleneck so to speak at funnel three and of course another uh, example of that is if you have a toll plaza and if cars slow down through toll plaza a but then toll plaza B is wide open and you can just, uh, you know, it's not, it, 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 you can just sort of flow through that, then how quickly you get through these two toll plazas is going to be determined by the slow one, toll plaza A. And if toll plaza A is wide open and you just go blasting through that, but you have to pay a toll at plaza B, then that's going to slow you up and that's going to be the bottleneck step. Okay, so how do we determine the rate law? Well, it's going to all depend on the slow step. So here is the process that we use. Well, first of all, we got to write out the rate law for the rate limiting step because that's what's going to determine the rate. So remember, if it's a step, we can just use the stoichiometry to write the rate law. So what should the rate law be for step two? And hopefully you say, well, we'll get to that in a sec. Uh, now for the equilibrium step, equilibrium we've done before means that the reaction uh, in this case of NO making N2O2 and the reaction of N2O2 making NO, the forward and reverse reactions, those reaction rates are equal. That's what equilibrium means and that's fast. So we're going to now have reaction rates being equal for both directions of step one 
The rate law can't have an intermediate, so if you get a rate law which has an N2O2 or an N2O in it, those are not reactants, they're not products. Rate laws only deal with reactants and products. Intermediates are used up too quickly, uh, so they cannot be part of the overall rate law. So if you have an intermediate, you have to find some mathematical way uh, to get rid of it. Now let's see how this works in practice for our proposed mechanism. So the first thing you do is we use the slow step because that's rate determining. The slow step is step two. So the rate for the overall reaction will be the rate for step two. And since, the, uh, since step two is an elementary step, we can get its rate law from the stoichiometry of the reaction. So the rate for step two is K for step two times H2 concentration to the first power because the coefficient of H2 is one times N2O2 concentration to the first power because uh, the coefficient for N2O2 is one. And we're going K sub two to indicate the rate constant for step two because steps one and three will have their own rate constants which won't be the same as the rate constant for step two. Okay, now if this rate equals K2 times H2 to the first times N2O2 concentration to the first, if both substances in the rate law were either reactants or products, we'd actually be done. But H2 is in fact a reactant, but N2O2, as we saw before, is an intermediate, and we cannot have an intermediate in the rate law. So how do we get rid of the intermediate? Well, we know that step one is an equilibrium step. It's fast, but it's equilibrium, and equilibrium means that the rate of step one going forward and the rate of step one going backwards have to be equal. So rate of step one forwards equals rate of step one backwards, and since that's an elementary step, we can actually write the rate law from the actual reaction equation, the step equation, uh, using the stoichiometry because it's a step. So give that a try. What's the rate for step one? What's the rate for step? Uh, what's the rate for step one going forwards? What's the rate for step one going backwards? And then we'll equate them. And hopefully you said rate for step one going forwards is k forwards times n o to the second power. So going forwards, it's n o to the second power. And we're going to have a rate constant I'm going to call k forward. And then going backwards, we're going this direction. Rate for step one going backwards is a k backwards. And k backwards and k forwards aren't exactly the same. And then times N2O2 to the first power. And since rate one forward and rate one backwards are equal, then we can equate those two things. And note when we solve k forwards times NO to the second power equals k backwards times N2O2 to the first power. And so we want to get N2O2 by itself because that's what we're going to substitute for because we have to get rid of it. And so we're going to divide both sides by k backwards. And so when we equate and solve, we get that N2O2 equals k forward over k backward times NO squared. And now we're going to substitute this N2O2 into the N2O2 to the first in the rate law for the slow step. So this chunk here gets substituted into there. And so what we have is rate equals K2, there's the K2, times H2 to the first, H2 to the first, and then N2O2 gets substituted for K forward over K backwards times NO squared, which comes from what we solved just above. And so that is actually our rate law from this mechanism. But then we clean it up a little bit by noting that K2 uh, and K1 forward and K1 backwards are all just rate constants. So each one of those is a constant, so we're going to just combine them all into a single constant. And so now we have rate equals some constant K times H2 to the first times NO to the second. 
And that's the rate law that we get from this mechanism. And notice H2 and NO are both reactants, so we're okay. And now, what can we conclude? Well, hopefully you would say the proposed mechanism is K, uh, rate equals K times, uh, let's go back to it again, rate equals K times H2 to the first times NO to the second. The rate law that we got from the experiment was the exact same thing. So the proposed mechanism gives the known rate law, and what that means is it's plausible. We don't know for sure this is the right mechanism, but we know it has a chance of working. It at least makes some sense, um, and that's the best we can do at this point. And further experimental work would then be needed to uh, see if you can find some support for this proposed mechanism or find a way to, to disprove it. So for example, if you were to do some experimental work and you could detect briefly N2O2 molecules or N2O molecules that just appeared really briefly and then disappeared, that would be evidence that N2O2 and N2O formed as intermediates, and that would be supporting evidence for this proposal, uh, proposed mechanism being correct. Um, so we can provide support for a proposed mechanism or disprove it via further experimental work. And to use the sort of cheesy analogy of solving a crime, if, uh, although it seems like the evidence might indicate that Professor Plum shot Colonel Mustard with the revolver in the billiard room because his fingerprints were found on the gun. What if deeper investigation found out that Colonel Mustard was filthy rich? He was a big old money bags. And some surveillance camera footage showed that Miss Scarlet, that hussy, was uh, videoed carrying a revolver wearing latex gloves through the billiard room into Professor Plum's bedroom and then came out later uh, without the revolver and residue of, latex, of uh, talcum powder from the latex gloves was found on the revolver. Now you might have a different scenario. You might start wondering maybe Professor Plum didn't do it maybe Miss Scarlet was somehow trying to get her hands on Colonel Mustard's money, and there's some evidence that at a minimum muddies the water um, and possibly provides a different explanation for what the crime was. Okay, so yeah, corny example, but um, it's, it's something like that with mechanisms and with crime solving. And that is it for chemical kinetics class number three, and in fact for chemical kinetics formal instruction as well.